This morning's scripture lesson is John 3, 1 through 18. There was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. After dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. What do you mean? exclaimed Nicodemus. How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it wants, just as you can hear the wind, but you can't tell where it is coming from or where it is going. You can't explain how people are born of the Spirit how are these things possible? Nicodemus asked. Jesus replied, You are a respected Jewish teacher, and yet you don't understand these things. I assure you, we tell you what we know and have seen, and yet you won't believe our testimony. But if you don't believe me when I tell you about the earthly things, how can you possibly believe what I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ever gone to heaven and returned, but the Son of Man has come down from heaven. And as Moses lifted the bronze snake on the pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. For this is how God loved the world. He gave His one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. God sent His Son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through Him. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in Him, but anyone who does not believe in Him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only Son. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Alan. I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 3 as we move into week number 2 of our new sermon series that I've entitled True or False, Finding the Good News in John's Gospel. Our foundational scripture for this series is from John 8 verse 32 and it says you will know the truth and the truth will set you free and what we're going to see as we move through the gospel of John is that much of what John is doing here is designed to take a very common falsehoods very common misunderstandings about uh, how to know God how to find God all of these different questions about God uh, he's taking the falsehoods and he's saying this is false here is what's actually true about the God that we serve and who has created us and who gives us life. So you can see where we've been and where we're headed. We'll be on this uh, same series through the first week or so of September. Last week we answered a very important and fundamental question, and for many of you this was review. For others of you, maybe not so much. But we were answering the question, where is God? How do we find God in our uh, series or our sermon last week talked about these three vital truths that we have to adhere to when we're finding God. Number one, we learned that following the rules is not enough. Number two, that Jesus provides the path to God. And thirdly, that Jesus makes God personal. And so our one sentence sermon last week was that the one true God came to earth, lived a perfect life, died on the cross, and rose from the dead for a purpose. And that was to provide eternal life to all of those who will believe. And so this week, we ask a very closely related question, which is, okay, now I've found God, how do I use that knowledge of God, that relationship with God, in order to get to heaven? 
Uh, I don't know how many of you saw this series that just ended this last year, but it was really it was a really good series. It's a comedy that was on uh, network TV during the week. It was called The Good Place, and the premise of The Good Place was that you have these four people who die, and uh, one minute they're going through their lives, and the next minute they open their eyes, and they find themselves sitting in this strange office, and they have a man sitting across from them who identifies himself as Michael, and he's an angel, and he's assigned to show them around because they've made it to the good place. They've died, and they've made it to heaven, and he's going to show them around and help them get accustomed to uh, their new eternal dwelling place. And so... Uh, as they go through this process, they start to ask questions, and one of the very first questions is, how did I get here? And uh, none of them are particularly religious people, so Michael explains that uh, the way you get to heaven is you earn points, and everybody who gets to heaven has to earn a minimum of 900,000 positive points during the course of their life. And so he gives them uh, a list, you can see some of the lists there on the screen about things you can do to earn positive points. So uh, if you end slavery, you get really close to getting to heaven just for that. You earn 814,292.09 points. So if you can do something really significant like that, that's great. You may do something a little more mundane. For instance, uh, maintaining your composure in line at a water park in Houston, you get 61.14 positive points. So that's the good news, but then there's bad news. Uh, the bad news is that every time you do something wrong or something bad or something inconsiderate, you lose those positive points. So things are moving back and forth uh, between positive and negative. So for instance, uh, when you tell a woman to smile, uh, you lose 53.83 points. When you ruin an opera with boorish behavior, you lose 90.9 .9 points. And so your total is constantly moving back and forth throughout the course of your life. And then there's another piece to it, which is you only earn positive points when you do it with the right motivation. If you're earning positive points just with the intention of getting in good with God, then those points don't count. And so as the first season goes on, it slowly begins to dawn on these people that it is impossible to earn your way to heaven. Nobody can earn 900,000 minimum points uh, in this system and be able to deserve a place in the good place. And so I won't spoil it for you, but they come to some very important realizations uh, that change the whole plot of the story. And so the point I want you to think about this morning is that many times, many people that I talk to are misinformed about how to get to heaven. They assume that I can earn my way there. That's the way to get to heaven. And one of the things that scares me the most is I'll ask people, uh, just in conversation, you know, how, where do you think you'll go when you'll die? You die. Well, I hope I go to the good place. Well, how do you get to the good place? And they'll give me answers like, well, you know, I went through confirmation when I was 13, so I think I'm in good. Or I've been a member of the United Methodist Church for my entire life. You know, I, I go to church once or twice a month. I always put something in the offering plate. I've tried to live a good life. I'm a good person. I don't cuss. I don't steal. Uh, they give this list of things, which is just like the points here. But yet, just like the show points out, it doesn't matter how many good things you do. There are always bad things that outweigh that we can never be good enough. And so our foundational thought for this morning is that there is only one path to eternal life, and that is acceptance of a gift. But it's a special kind of gift. It's a gift that requires the rest of our life in order to acquire. The gift is free. It's given freely to us. We accept it. But the acceptance, the acquisition of that gift takes the rest of our life. It's a process that you've heard me talk about quite a bit. We're going to talk about it again today because it's so important. Uh, John Wesley called it sanctification, this process of accepting Jesus into our life and then allowing ourselves to be molded and shaped and made more like Christ throughout the rest of our life. And this is not an easy process. It can be very frustrating. At times it can be very discouraging. C.S. Lewis in his classic text, Mere Christianity, talks about this, and he says it boils down to this. Lose your life and you will save it. Look for yourself and you will find in the long run only hatred, loneliness, despair, rage, ruin, and decay. But look for Christ and you will find him. And with him, everything else thrown in. Sanctification is this process of learning to look for Christ midst of life's confusion. So the question we answer this morning is, how do I get to heaven? Maybe the most important question uh, you can ask yourself on any given day. And we're going to see that there are three required changes in response to 
the lie that's presented here in John chapter 3. And the lie is this. As long as I'm sincere, as long as my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds, I'll go to heaven when I die. We're going to see this morning that John actually says, no, that's not the case. Here's what, what is required. Number one, a change of mind. Number two, a change of life. And number three, a change of identity. Our one sentence sermon this morning is simple but yet profound. Eternal life cannot be earned. Instead, it requires a spiritual rebirth. So we begin with a change of mind. John tells us this. He says, God gave His one and only Son so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. And so that begs the question, what does it mean to believe? Uh, there is going to be a difference, as we'll see this morning, between intellectual assent, saying, I believe that the lights are on in here. I believe that you are here and I am here, and actually having a belief that changes who we are. Uh, we can identify ba five basic types of belief, and it starts with the very simple and moves its way up to the very complex. So see where you fit on this particular scale. The, the lowest, the most simple type of belief is belief in existence. Uh, we can say God exists, and I can ask this question wherever I go, and I know that about 85% of people are going to say, yes, I believe a God exists. I believe that things did not come into existence. Creation did not happen by accident. People call it the man upstairs or my higher power, whatever you want to call it. But they'll say, yeah, God exists. And the book of James says, great, you do well to believe that. Guess what? The demons also believe that God exists, but it hasn't changed their eternal destiny. The second level is association. We not only believe that God exists, but now we notice that People who believe in God, who worship God, seem to be happier than other people. Uh, it's part of what draws us to church. We see people at church. We see people around town who go to church regularly, and we make this association. God and good things tend to go together. The third level is equivalence. Now we say, okay, yep, there is a God somewhere. People who believe in a God seem to have a better life. Uh, but all religions are basically the same. It doesn't matter what I believe, as long as I believe there is a God, I'll be okay. Fourth level is in action. Now we're starting to see that I play a part in this. We say, when I pray, good things happen. I don't know whether it's because I'm praying, I don't know whether it's because God is answering my prayers, or whether I'm just believing it into existence, whether my positive attitude changes my life, but again, things seem to happen. And then we reach this fifth level, which is the important one here, which is causation. And it says, when I pray, good things happen. Why? Because God makes them happen. That is belief. That is what John is talking about here. It's the kind of belief that's spoken of in Hebrews 11, verse 6, where we're told uh, very simply, very straightforwardly, it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to Him must do this. Believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. There has to be a causative relationship associated with belief. John talks about believing that whoever believes in God, the word here, pistuyo, in the Greek, means to be persuaded through God's inbirthing of faith. In other words, a seed is planted inside of us, and as that seed takes root, as it grows, as it begins to bear fruit, our belief grows with it. It's a change of mind that leads to obedience. Okay, that's great. Uh, we can see this uh, illustrated in Romans chapter 4 where it talks about belief. We go back to the story of Abraham. And remember that Abraham existed before Jesus lived and died on the cross and rose again. And so uh, salvation was not uh, generally available to people at that particular time. But we're told that God credited Abraham with uh, with eternal life because of his belief. We're told Abraham believed. He bestowed the Lord, and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. Well, how do we know that Abraham believed? We know that because when God told Abraham, if you leave your home country and go to the place that I will show you, I will do these great things for you. And Abraham packed up and he moved based on that faith. When he waited and waited and waited for his son, and his son is finally born, and God says, then take your only son Isaac and sacrifice him to me. Abraham packed up his son, and he went to the top of the mountain, and he built the altar, and he was ready to kill and sacrifice his son before God stopped him. In other words, his belief led to 
a change in behavior for him. Here's, here's another way to put it. Lightfoot puts it this way. He says, faith is not static, but instead it is inseparable from repentance, from surrender, and from a supernatural longing to obey. As this seed of faith that's growing inside of your heart and your soul begins to bear fruit, we see a necessary change in our behavior. And some of those things are immediate. Some of those things take place as we grow and we change. Now, I can tell you in my own life, I can remember when I accepted Jesus and I let that uh, seed be planted in my heart and it began to take root. At that time in my life, I had a horrible potty mouth. I could not speak a sentence without cussing all the time. That was one of those things that disappeared right away. It was just, I didn't have to say those words anymore. I didn't want to say those words anymore. Uh, my speech was cleaned up. But there were other things about me that had to change. I was an enormous grudge holder. If you did something wrong to me, if you disappointed me, if you didn't meet my expectations, I could be mad at you for a long, long time. And I could shut you out. And over the course of my life, as God worked in my life and in my heart, that disappears, that goes away. I'm a much more forgiving person. I'm a much more uh, welcoming person. I don't hold people's mistakes and their shortcomings against them to the degree that I used to. I still struggle with it sometimes, but it's not nearly the problem that it was. Here's the point, is that the way to heaven begins with developing and, and adopting the right kind of belief, the kind of belief that leads to obedience, that change of mind that leads to obedience. Thinking that does not result in changed behavior is merely a sin, and a sin doesn't get us anywhere. Our first key point is that the first step on the road to heaven is the realization that we cannot remain as we are. We talked last week about the law and how discouraging the law is. It's presented to us and it says in order to be worthy of God's love, in order to be worthy of eternal life, you have to be perfect. You have to keep all of these rules, and the point of them is not try to keep them, but to understand, I can't do this. And as we accept that, then we begin to realize that something about me has to change, and I can't do it by myself. Curtis Hudson puts it this way, faith and repentance are the same. When we realize I can't stay the same, we also realize there is something fundamentally wrong with the way that I am. They are not two separate decisions. One cannot trust God, Christ as Savior without repenting or changing his mind. The very fact that he trusts Christ for salvation shows that he has changed his mind regarding sin, salvation, and God. This is the process of transformation that Paul talks about in the book of Romans. And in Romans 12, chapter 2, he urges those who have accepted Christ and have that seed planted within them. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. In other words, don't be satisfied to be like everybody else, but instead be transformed by the renewing of your mind, by the changing of your mind day-by-day day basis. So we begin our journey to heaven by committing to allowing God to change our minds. Secondly, we commit to allowing God to change our life. John continues, and he says, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Uh, being born again is one of those uh, concepts that different uh, denominations, different parts of the faith struggle with. They have different <laughs> beliefs about it. I can remember uh, growing up in a different faith tradition, and there was this idea that, uh, you know, after we sang 66 verses of Just As I Am, and the service stretched out for an hour, and you finally came down to the front and you said the sinner's prayer, that, boom, your life was changed. You were never going to sin again, and if you did sin again, then maybe your salvation wasn't real. But what we know is that change is actually much more gradual for human beings. Change takes time. It takes effort. It takes mistakes. In 1982, a psychologist by the name of Leo Prochaska was working with people who were trying to quit smoking. And one of the things he discovered in his work was that it didn't matter what the program was or how brilliant it was uh, laid out or uh, how hard they worked with the people. Most people said on a given day, okay, Monday I'm going to quit smoking. And by Thursday of that week, they had smoked again. And they would say, okay, today I'm quitting again for real. And then by Saturday, they had smoked again. And it took time. It took lots of mistakes, lots of two steps forward, one step back, in order for them to make those changes. And so he identified these stages of change that we use uh, in addictions work uh, today, as well as when we're trying to help people uh, change other behaviors, whether it's you know, weight loss or whether it's anger management, uh, lots of different things. 
we start off in this stage that he calls pre-contemplation, where we are unaware that we have a problem. I don't know smoking is bad for me. I don't know I'm too heavy. I don't know it's because I'm eating too much. I'm not aware. But suddenly we move to this next stage where the light bulb goes on. We go, oh, okay, I have high blood pressure because of these habits. And if I continue these habits, bad things are going to happen. So we're aware of the problem, and we think to ourselves, it would be really nice to change my behavior, to lower my blood pressure, to be a healthier person. Then we move to step number three, which is preparation, where we've decided, yeah, I'm going to take action. It's, you know, the end of July right now, I'm thinking, you know, that'll be my New Year's resolution. I'll make that happen. That'll give me six more months to really do it up and live like I want to. But then, New Year's Day, life is going to change. Then we reach the next stage, which is called action. Now we've decided, okay, fun's over. I've got to buckle down. I've got to change what I'm doing. And we begin to change our outward behavior. And then finally, over time, as we maintain that outward behavior, we reach this stage he calls maintenance, where we've changed our habits and our life is observably different because of it. It sounds really simple. It sounds like a steady progression, but the fact is people move up a stage, they move back a stage. They move up a stage and then they hit another stage and then they move back again. And time or change takes time. It's, it's a very frustrating process. Jesse Scholl puts it this way. Lasting change rarely occurs as the result of a single ongoing decision to act. Instead, change evolves from a subtle, complex, and sometimes circuitous progression. One that involves thinking, hesitating, stepping forward, stumbling backward, and quite possibly starting all over again. What I would propose to you this morning is that many times we make a decision for Christ. That seed of faith and belief is planted within us, but our outward behavior takes time to line up. And so we want to make sure that we're not judging other people for the mistakes that they make. Somebody can be a Christian, somebody can be progressing in their lifestyle and still do things that are unbecoming from time to time. This is purely a hypothetical example, but maybe you have somebody who is uh, even a pastor of a church and sometimes when he's at his kids' ball games, he loses control and he stands up and he yells hurtful and rude things at the referees because he's not happy about that. I don't know who would do that, but that, that can happen from time to time, I'm told. Uh, it doesn't mean that person is not saved. It doesn't mean they're a bad person. It means they're somewhere on that continuum. They're still learning to change their behaviors. So Jesus says we must be born again. This is a term that I don't think is really well translated from what I've read. We're going to see that it actually maybe could be better translated. Born again is two different Greek words here, genabo and noten, and it means uh, to be brought over to another way of life from above, from the very beginning. And so some translations today, rather than saying you must be born again, instead say you must be born from above. Uh, here's, here's why that makes more sense. Uh, this word is used in Mark when it talks about when Jesus is crucified. We're told at the moment that Jesus gives up his spirit it says the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two, ano ten, from top to bottom. And you have to keep in mind, this was an enormous curtain. This separated uh, the inner sanctuary of the temple from the Holy of Holies, this place where the Spirit of God was supposed to reside. And there was this curtain that was 60 feet tall, and it was made of wool. It was extremely thick. It was about three and a half inches thick. So stop and think about that. That's, you know, about this thick, it's wool. 60 feet tall, and the moment when Jesus died, it, it's ripped from not from the bottom to the top. It's not cut gradually, but from 60 feet up in the air, three and a half inches of wool is it's just cut in half. It's God's anger. It's God's grief, this sorrow as this, uh, this curtain is torn in two, and access is given to us, to God. And if you think about it, changes in our life have to happen that way too. We can't start at the bottom and gradually work our way up has to start at the top. It has to start from the very beginning, and it is very difficult. It's something that can only happen with the help of God. The uh, Greek philosopher Philo talks about this concept of Anno 10, and he says this. Uh, he says, if one teaches the son of his neighbor the law, the scripture reckons this the same as though he had begotten him. In other words, we do a great service to other people when we make them aware of God's standard, we teach them God's process for changing their life and granting them eternal life, and that gives us a special place in their life. Their life has changed from that point forward. 
second point is this, that the way to heaven continues with a deliberate and purposeful change of habits. It's not enough to just sit back and go, well, God will change me if he wants to, but instead we have to be in active partnership with God and say, okay, I'm going to try harder that next game not to lose my cruel, not to yell hurtful and hateful things. I'm going to sit here and be a good citizen. And as we change our priorities, that reflects a changed life. Second key point is that the second step down the road to heaven is an observable and a consistent change in how we live each day. We should be able to look back over the last year and say, these are some very practical ways that God's changed my priorities. He's changed who I am. He's changed how I spend my time, my money, what I talk about, how I treat the people around me. All of those things should be changing because of the life of Christ growing within me. James talks about this in chapter 2, and he says, Faith by itself is not enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. Or as Michael Hyatt puts it, repentance is not only a change of mind, it is a change of direction. Which direction was your life going before Jesus came into your life? What direction is it going now? It should be very, two very different things. Lastly, we have a change of identity. We're told this great news, John chapter 3, verse 17. God sent his son in the world not to judge the world, not to send us to hell, not to make us miserable, but instead to save the world through him. Victor Hugo's classic novel, Les Miserables, uh, the protagonist is a man by the name of Jean Valjean. And, uh, we're told in the beginning that Valjean is uh, presented with a, just an untenable conflict. He has uh, his sister who uh, is sick and her child needs to be fed and they don't have any money and the child is on the point of starving to death and so finally Valjean uh, in desperation breaks the window of a bakery and steals a loaf of bread so that he can feed his sister and her son and he's arrested for this and he's bizarrely uh, sentenced to 19 years of hard labor and he's told when he goes to the labor camp your name is no longer John Valjean you are prisoner 24601 and for 19 long years as he's abused and he's subjected to punishment for his crime he's only referred to as 24601 finally the day comes when a man by the name of inspector javert presents himself and he tells uh, valjean uh, you are now set free you have served your time and valjean is celebrating because he's saying i'm, I'm no longer 24601 i'm john valjean again and javert uh, lashes out at him and he says, no, you will never be Jean Valjean again. You are and will always be prisoner 24601. And he hands him a large yellow sheet of paper. And he says, follow to the letter your itinerary, this badge of shame that you'll show until you die. And the idea is that you are defined by your mistakes, you're defined by your sin, by your crime, and you will be defined by it for the rest of your life. And so the entire rest of the story is Valjean's struggle to leave behind the identity of prisoner 24601, the shame, the condemnation, the separation from God's grace, and to accept that and to become who he is again. His identity changed, and now his identity must change again. And that's, uh, that's what we are presented with when we accept Jesus as well. Uh, we have the opportunity to change our sinful identity. The word here in the Greek, save, is sozo, and it means to be healed, interestingly. It means to be rescued from the power and the penalty of sin. But as we're going to see in the Greek, uh, this word is, is uh, very colorful. It has very deep meaning to it. Uh, we see this used in Matthew chapter 8, verse 25, uh, when they're out and they're caught in a storm on the sea, and uh, they think they're going to die. Uh, the, the, the storm is so bad that these seasoned fishermen are frightened for their life. And uh, Jesus, in the midst of this storm, is asleep. He's lying on a pillow. They go to him and they wake him up and they shout, Lord, sozo, save us. Why? Because we're going to drown. I love this picture of Jesus when uh, Peter walks on the water and Peter uh, thinks he has his faith together and then he loses it and he begins to sink beneath the surface and Jesus rescues him. And I love the picture because if you look at it very closely, you'll see uh, Jesus very firmly has a hold of Peter's ribs. Peter can't do anything for himself. Peter is helpless. Peter is going to live or die based on Jesus' strength. And Jesus is lifting him up out of the water. The same is true of us. When we ask to be saved, we are admitting, I am helpless. I am not a person who has it all together. I'm not a person who can earn this. I'm not a person 
who is worthy of your help, it's based completely upon your mercy. William Barclay, uh, the great Quaker theologian, puts it this way. He says, Sozo means both to save in the eternal sense and to heal in the physical sense. Salvation in the New Testament saves both body and soul. What I want you to think about this morning is that your salvation is not just something that happens at one point in life and we never go back and revisit it again until the day that we die, but instead that salvation is working itself out from within, through us, through our bodies, through the lives of those around us. It is alive, it is dynamic, it is relevant, and it is saving us both body and soul. The third point is that the way to heaven concludes with a significant change in our source of hope, our source of meaning, and our source of worth. Perspectives must change in the light of eternity. Things that were important to us before, being popular, being good looking, having a whole lot of money, having the nicest house, having the nicest car, are no longer important because our perspective has shifted based on our salvation. Our last key point is that the third step to heaven is a shift in focus from my agenda on the here and now to God's kingdom agenda in the context of eternity. When we accept that gift of Christ, we are told that we're also given spiritual gifts. We are given special abilities that are designed not to make us rich, not to make us famous, but to edify the church around us, to serve in the ministries of the church. So as our identity changes, our purpose changes with it. Martin Luther King uh, puts it really well. His prayer, famous prayer, Use me, God. Show me how to take who I am, who I want to be, and what I can do, and to use it for a purpose greater than myself. If you feel dead in your faith, if you feel dissatisfied, unfulfilled in your faith, my encouragement to you is that maybe your prayer needs to mirror that of Martin Luther King. God, what do you want to do with this gift of salvation that you have given to you? Paul puts it this way in 2 Corinthians 5. Anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old self is gone, and the new life has begun. The only question is, will you leave that old person behind? Will you leave that old life, those old priorities, those old ways of doing things behind, and move toward this new life? In conclusion, three questions to ask yourself this week. Number one, have I even realized that I am not yet a finished product? Is it possible that God's not through with me? And that's true whether I'm 25 or 35 or 55 or 85. God has plans for your life. God wants to do things in and through you. Number two, has my day-to-day -day approach to life changed to more closely resemble Christ? Or am I still the same person I was 10, 15, 20 years ago? And finally, am I living in the light of eternity I still living only for today. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word, but most of all, we thank you for the free gift of God that is eternal life in Christ Jesus. We thank you that not only can we not earn it, but that we don't have to earn it. We thank you for that gift, and I pray that you would give us insight, that you would give us courage to uh, continue to not only accept that gift, but to strive to acquire it in the days that we have left on this earth. We ask this. come back next week, we will move on to our third truth, which has to do with the love of God. What it means, what it is, the significance of it for your life and for mine. I'll leave you with this benediction from 2 Peter chapter 3. The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, but instead is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come 